Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Welcome to the Become Famous podcast. I'm really excited to have Stefan Moritz, who I discovered on LinkedIn, had some provoking, interesting uh, issues on branding. And I just said, you got to come on. We have to talk about this. So welcome, Stefan. How are you? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very well. Thanks. <laughs> so you, we just be right before the call, you said you're from South Africa, but you live in the Netherlands. And how did that come about? And what fascinates you so much with branding? Because you're very much a vocal person on LinkedIn. I think you've got some really thought provoking, interesting things that I think the whole industry itself needs to become more aware of. Ah, cool. Um, South Africa, Netherlands, not that interesting. Um, <laughs> I've got a German passport. I'm very lucky. So uh, opportunity came by and we made the decision to just uh, to move over. And uh, it's been very good to us. Um, on branding, uh, I wanted to be a lawyer my entire life. No way. And um, actually studied for it and then at some point realized this is definitely not what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I do not want to sit through uh, court cases and uh, read up on other court cases. And uh, quite young in my life, a uh, career advisor told me perhaps marketing is for you. And uh, I investigated a little bit, absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, but the part I really fell in love with was the psychology around it. So yeah. like, uh, obviously, why do people get obsessed with brands? Like, why do we buy what we buy? And uh, decided that I want to just specialize in that. And ever since that, I've uh, kind of dedicated my life to what I like to call brand first, content second marketing, um, based on the, the concept that if, if you can create a famous brand, uh, people will start buying it. And uh, you can build a community. Wow. Brand first, content second. That's a really, I, I totally agree with you. It's finding your brand. How do you, how do you help people find their brand? What has been the thing that you've learned along the way in these years? So there's uh, obviously there's, there's business brands and then there's personal brands. Um, I work more on the business side. Um, but naturally if you can build a business brand, you can build a personal brand. And I think where the personal branding really comes in is if you are working in marketing, um, you, it's kind of up to you to build your own brand and establish yourself in the industry. Uh, you have all these tools to your, um, uh, that you can use to build a brand that you can post content and you can really get out there. And if you apply the same strategy that you apply to businesses, you can easily apply that to your person and you realize there's a big overlap uh, between the two. So naturally I've been helping uh, quite uh, some founders actually launch their brands. And then naturally there's this founder brand that comes with it. Um, and uh, it, it's definitely stretched beyond the business world. But uh, I basically tackle it the same way you would take a go-to-market strategy for a company. Um, You are a person and you are a brand, whether you like it or not. Your colleagues, your friends, your family, the guy at the gym, they all have a perception about you. They think something about you, know something about you. And you've got the power to influence that through certain elements, Um, the same way we do with marketing in business. And we basically then just apply that strategy to a personal brand um, and start with a, an objective, a strategy, and design out how you can build your brand and shape perceptions. And uh, yeah, it's an exciting journey. So you do personal brand and company branding, is that correct? Yes. Yes. So uh, for me, at least in the last couple of years, I really see uh, that we are not just a person, but we are a product. And would you say that having to have more of a personal brand is kind of a testament to the times and the age that we live in, that we also need to look at ourselves as a product. hundred percent. I think where the world is going, if you cannot sell yourself, you are setting yourself up for a very hard time. Um, There's fewer jobs than there's people. We know that obviously. Um, So on a very basic level, you are competing for a job. Um, 
and then from there you can do other things right you can maybe start a company um look for your dream job uh write a book try to sell it it really goes in every direction but if you can't sell yourself then you are setting yourself up to be at the bottom of the barrel if there's someone else that can sell themselves better in the same field that you want to they are just going to make it out the top uh, above you so i think given the world of social media um if you don't do the effort of setting yourself up then how is someone going to find you how is someone going to build a perception about you and why would someone pay for your time your services or you as a product so i think it's super 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 important for everyone to at least have uh, you know a linkedin profile or a, a instagram profile if it, if that's uh, where your audience hangs out uh, to have a decent looking cv uh, to put yourself out into the world because otherwise you just become invisible so interesting because that's what I recently wrote on my book uh, is the fame revolution that we're in a revolution where everyone has to become known. What you're saying is everyone has to be able to sell themselves. Um, when did you see that shift? Because uh, I I saw it like right after the pandemic, but it just seemed like it's just proliferated to the place where I think a lot of people are confused right now on what to do. So twofold. Uh, number one. I think where the marketing industry is heading, people don't buy from companies anymore. They buy from people. And uh, we see quite a big influx on the demand generation side of things, uh, which is really, it, it comes down to, I know about you, I know what you're selling, and you are my preferred option when a problem arises that is uh, in that category. So there's this big push on founder-led marketing, pretty much. Like there's a face of the company that uh, presented. I think we see it quite a bit with celebrities at the moment. Uh, a lot of like movie stars and Hollywood stars are launching jet brands and whiskey brands and fashion brands and whatnot. And that is, that's really testament of where the world is at. Um, obviously that's on a very like famous scale, but companies don't work very differently. Even if it's like a small SaaS company, if your founder has a strong presence on say LinkedIn, you're more likely to sell your brand out there than someone who this founder doesn't have a presence. So that's on the marketing side. And then on, on the personal side for myself, uh, given this, like I said, I work in marketing, uh, you have to be able to sell yourself. So about two and a half years ago, I started like religiously posting on LinkedIn uh, about the, the stuff I'm passionate about, which is mostly branding and uh, personal branding content, the stuff you see and got to see in the first place. And I realized the opportunities that come with this is, uh, is absolutely substantial. Um, I would not stop for anything. And at the same time, I'm living out of passion, uh, teaching people things they don't know. I'm helping founders, I'm helping people build brands. But at the same time, naturally, I'm building my own brand and my doors are just opening up left, right and center. And anyone that comes across my path, this is what I kind of, you know, want to tell them is put yourself out there and doors will open. And uh, you do that by building your personal brand or rather taking control of your personal brand. You've done a quite an excellent job, I have to say. I noticed you and I think um, you've really, like I've noticed you for a couple of weeks before I asked and I've just been engaging in your post. I think you're thought provoking. Um, how did you come about your brand? How did you, did you have someone help you uh, with your brand? And how often do you post and what have you learned from going on this journey for two and a half years? My own brand, that's that's all me. Um, no help, just uh, what I could find on the internet and actually just, uh, I'm a bit of a data junkie, so I post, I make my own calculations. So if, if someone says post at seven o'clock in the morning, I'd be like, cool, I'll test this for myself. Um, basically, let's see what happens if I post at seven at night. Does it do anything different? I'll figure that out. Um, Did it do anything different? Not really. No, not if your not if your audience is obviously quite global. Uh, you're it's seven o'clock somewhere, right? At the end of the day. <laughs> um, so I could I could really not advise people to to care about what all these the so called LinkedIn influencers tell about, like oh you have to post at this time and do that, and it's really about just post meaningful content. Uh, I'll get to that in a second, but the brand I build around myself is is one hundred percent just me at the end of the day. Um, I think it does also come from 
on a, in, a, in a younger time in my life, I was uh, wanted to be a rock star and spend a lot of time on a on a stage. Um, and I think if you're a band and a, a musician, you naturally have to build a brand around yourself as well. So, what did you do? Did you sing or did you sing, write, play guitar? with friends, nothing major, I never really got anywhere, but it, it still established that kind of spotlight feeling of uh, don't be afraid to get up on the stage and, and sing your own song at the end of the day. Like it's, it's when you go over from covers to your own material where the magic starts happening. And I think it's, it's no different when you do your, put your own content out into the world. Like everyone has something to teach someone, right? Um, a mechanic, a plumber can teach me how to fix an engine or to fix the sink while I can teach someone how to do a bit of marketing and branding. And it's really just stepping over that, that, that ledge of like, I do have something that I can offer and then making it accessible. For um, I often have the saying, there's only two types of people in this world. There's those who create and those who consume. Um, and it's the ones who create to excel, uh, whether that is a, a momfluencer video on Instagram or TikTok, or it's uh, a big CEO of uh, a big uh, Fortune 50 company or Fortune 500 company that puts their advice into the world. Um, so personal brand, just figure that out myself. And I'm really just doing what I love doing at the end of the day. Um, and the second part of the question was, what did I learn on this journey? Yeah. It's really just number one, get out there, uh, find a medium that works for you. Um, if you like to making selfie videos, do that. You don't have to write. If you're good at writing, write. If you can design, design. If you can't, just write something into into your post. Um, you do need a plan. Like set an objective. And when I work with personal brands, I always tell someone it's not the same as a company where you set a vision necessarily. But write down what you want people to think, know, and say about you those three things. And then once you've got that, figure out how to get there. What is the strategy? How do I build that? How do I dress? How do I talk? Who do I hang out with? Um, what does my CV look like? What does someone find when they search me online? What does my profile look like? How do I position that? What's a color that, uh, that fits my personality? And then what content can I make to actively put myself out there? And this can range anything from landing a job to building a following. So where the most basic side of this would be your CV and the most kind of extensive side would be a lot of content that you put out. So really find your goal, figure out how to get there, get an audience, figure out where they hang out and then just get to work. And I think getting to work is the hardest part. It really is. It, uh, and I, um, personally myself, I have been behind the scenes for 20 years and having to go front and center, forcing myself to write a book, getting out there. I really have appreciation for my clients that I've had because – it's, it's hard sometimes when you don't feel like you want to go out there. You don't feel like you have the message. And, and I think you having had that music background with your band, understanding the spotlight, how do you help people to make the jump? Because someone did my branding. Someone said that my brand has become famous for what you do. PR that works perfectly with you. And I couldn't talk about that for almost six months because for me, it just seemed cringeworthy. I was like, Oh, I, that's not me. Right. And yet um, I've embraced it now, but it, it's a journey. It's like you got the plan, but how do you jump and do the plan? Once again, the, the, the basic side of the scale of this is the, the excessive side. Um, I usually, when I do workshop with people on personal brands, I actually end with this uh, because it's very easy to, to come up with the plan. It's easy to put things on paper. It's easy to say, oh, I want to be this. I want to start this company. I want to be a freelancer with this amount of clients. And that it are cool. We get that. But how are you going to fit this into your day? Um, and what I often see with my customers is they, they start very strong. Like the, the first week, second week, there's good posts going out. There's a good thought process on uh, different people. Some write it down, plan it out, others do it on the fly. And then three, four weeks in, it just starts dying out a little bit. And through this, I realized that almost helping people organize their life around building a brand is really number one, the hardest part, but where you can really help them 
uh, to to Excel. So what I do is I oftentimes keep sending the messages. Remember to post, do this. Um, <laughs> don't stop like that's a good post i give the feedback on the stuff i see come through because to really commit to putting out or putting yourself out into the world in whichever format at a, at a high pace at a high frequency at good quality is the hardest thing and then the return is usually very low at the beginning that's the thing that people don't don't understand necessarily is there's no quick win to this you don't start posting on linkedin today and then tomorrow you've got a million impressions it doesn't happen um that takes years of posting and it's going to take a whole bunch of terrible performing posts it's going to take a whole bunch of learnings for yourself um you have to build a community you don't just buy a community so i think there's this really dedicating to a long-term plan like i'm putting two years or three years out to build what i want to build this is what i need to put out and i'm consistently going to do this for three times a week and then holding yourself to that, like making the bed in the morning or doing your daily exercise or doing the dishes at a certain time or, or whatever the case may be, uh, building brand needs to fit into your daily schedule as a commitment that you make to yourself as a human being for a prolonged period of time. And only then you will see the the benefits and the doors open on the other side. So you post, and people really underestimate that. Yeah, so you post on LinkedIn three times a week? No, not necessarily. Sometimes I go like a month without posting. Oh, really? Um if I'm too busy, I don't just make stupid posts for the sake of posting. So for me, it's quality over quantity. Um, and I've realized that that doesn't really affect it. Like, yes, if you are in a role of a lot of posts, you do get a little bit more reach, but not substantial. So I post when I've got an idea that is worthy of posting. Um, also working in marketing, I always teach my content teams that content marketing is only successful if you add value to your audience. And how do you add value? Um, especially in today's digital world, how do you stop someone scrolling in their toilet break? That is the question you need to answer. And if you can't answer that question with your content, don't post because then you're just wasting your own time and you're wasting your audience's time. So I only post when I feel like I've got something worthy to share. Now, sometimes it performs terrible. Sometimes it gets a million impressions. I have to deal with both of them. But that's kind of my philosophy here. And uh, I've got a busy life, so I also don't plan my content. I just, ah, I get an idea while I'm on the train or while I'm in the shower or sitting in the car, and then I'll just make a note, mental note, or sometimes I'll just dot it down on my little personal planner and then get back to it and, and make a post. And, uh, yeah, there's no structure, really. So when did you when did you start really going viral? <laughs> that's a very strange term. What is viral? Can you define viral? I think more than 10,000 impressions. Okay. Um, I want to say about the LinkedIn algorithm was different back then when I started, but a few months in, I would say like I saw my first decent performing post, which was 10,000 is now quite low for me. I can now get excited if I, if I go over the million, uh, which doesn't happen that often. That's why like, if I think viral, it's like, oh, I got a, I got a post where I wake up to like, uh, thousands of likes and shares and a million impressions. Um, it doesn't happen often. I don't see people going viral uh, just every day. And if we're talking like the upper side of like 50 to 100K uh, upwards, it is, it's almost like a lucky strike. You can't plan it. Uh, you can't predict it. Um, the only thing I do see is that if a piece of content went viral once, it will repeat going viral. Really? Um, but it's it's not by design. But so when was the first time you got in a million impression then? Um, in a week, that was about uh, two years ago. Okay. Um, and then the first time I had a million on a single post was actually about a month ago, where it was in a day, just a million on a on a single post so it, it really took me like two and a half years to to get to that point and it's it's not something that happens a lot and why do you think that post went viral what was the post i can't figure it out it right. might be the one you've seen which one was it uh, tell me the, the one with the carousel of the branding is not branding is not what you think it is oh i love that post uh, and I, I i think it's one of the most basic Post that I've ever created, and um, isn't that funny? Yeah, it's the weird thing about it, right? You don't know what people like, really. I think it struck me. 
Well, branding is not. And I, it's, and I think what struck me was the voice, your certainty of voice. And it was like suddenly having someone just cut through the noise. I think that's what you're posted cut through the noise. And it just really stopped you in your track. Right. Because it's like everyone is like kowtowing this, that, that. And you're like, this branding is not this. It's not this. It's not that. And there was another post similar to yours about PR, like what PR is and what it's not. And I was like, yes, because uh, I get so frustrated because I'm more in public relations. I do branding from more of a communication standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was just I appreciated that from a, a being someone that works in the field. So but it was quite, so how did it, so did it change anything? So like when you went viral, did it change anything? Did you get a lot of clients? What happened in that moment? Yes. So that is, the, that's the, the beautiful thing about it, right? Is when you don't try to sell and you go viral for, uh, for actual value or real conversational topics, uh, there's a lot of doors that open. So a lot of people will message you, a lot of people will initiate conversations. Um, you get like very high quality inbound leads because like, oh, you talk about branding, right? Or this, uh, someone checked out your profile and uh, did a little bit more research, ended up on my website for my newsletter or whatnot. Uh, it just creates opportunity. Um, that's my, my kind of analysis about around it is more eyes on what you put out there leads to more action. So if there's more impressions, there's more profile visits, there's more uh, newsletter signups, there's more website visits, naturally you're going to reach a larger, larger audience that might be interested in, in what you are offering and more people will be kind of prone to ask, hey, can you maybe help me with this? Um, or you get invited to a podcast and you talk and then someone else hears about <laughs> it. It's, it's this ripple effect that, that sits around it. Um, and that's what I back to the point of people often think you need to make a post and then a lot needs to happen. It's really this, this ongoing process of the more you put out there, the more ripples are. So it just keeps throwing stones in the pond and some stones might make a bigger splash than others. And the ripple effects are going to be different than the previous one, but you, you don't get ripple effects if you don't throw stones in the pond. That's a really very powerful thing. Um, so um, one thing that I always talk about, and I don't know if you agree with this as you're talking about having to remind people to do their personal brand. When you work from uh, communications, as I've done, helping leaders become known, and I always say that you're the person and you're the product. The company has to be a person and a product. And in that notion, do you think it would be valuable for people to think more of having a staff around like Grant Cardone, who's a influencer here in the United States talks a lot about you need to almost have a department of content marketing today because of reputation. And I would say it's not just content marketing, but it's having crisis management. If you're going to be canceled, if how are you going to go viral? I would say viral is even a crisis in itself because you have to meet a demand that you didn't have to do before. It's like you're exponentially exposed. And I don't know what you think about that. Cause that's the one thing I always say is, position yourself with having the help that you need from a company perspective i completely agree um i can't run a full content department on my own it, it's it's definitely not a one-man show um you need people who can design you need people who can uh, consistently write high value content you need uh, an editor of some sort that can can quality assure because people uh, when you put one in one mind together on a piece of content, it, it gets better. Um, obviously, when you need PR, there's someone that's that's good at media relations to get the word out there. Um, you need someone that understands branding and the mix. So I've run content departments from uh, two people shows to uh, you know 15 writers, for instance, or like a, the collection of like 15 people that that does the job. The bigger the content department, the bigger the reward. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the one thing I would I would 100% say. However, it's super hard to sell that because usually, same as a as a, a personal brand, it takes time to prove that it works. Like it, it's the hardest thing to tell uh, the this the chief financial officer, like, hey, I need money for another writer. Why? Um, <laughs> where's the return in that? Well, you're not going to see it today, 
But as brand fame rises, cost of acquisition or cost of goods sold will come down. And what's the five-year plan here? The more content we put out, the more people know about us. If someone doesn't know about us, they won't buy from us. The more content we put out, the more we can shape the perception, the faster we can build the, the brand. Um, the bigger the team, the better. But unfortunately, the world we live in, that is not always the case. It's, it's now kind of gearing more to a one-man marketing team with a few writers plugged in that's doing something occasionally. And I think that's, that's what I try to propose in the book is you can't do that. And I think one of the things I've realized even as a, um, I have a small team is, and even when I'm helping solo entrepreneurs, is you really need to think of yourself budgeting like you have a tax accountant you need to have your content marketing person you need to have something outside of yourself producing some of the work because it's overwhelming and too much i don't know if what you think about that yeah i, I completely agree um unless you're the the strongest writer in the room obviously there's uh like cases where you don't necessarily need a, a ghostwriter or someone um but for instance if you're someone that's very good at finance uh, or you're a exceptional developer, the chances that you're also a very good writer and very good at content distribution is quite low. Um, you do get cases, obviously, where people can can completely build that brand for themselves on a platform like LinkedIn or on uh, uh, one of the social media platforms. But at the end of the day, if if you're if you've got a profession that you can sell and you've got knowledge that you can transfer and that people are interested in. And if you've got a writer, even if it's one writer that can extract that information, uh, compile it or convert it into consumable content in different formats and get that out into the world, you're 100% a step ahead of someone else who doesn't have that person or team, depending on the setup. So how do we get the realization? I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. Uh, the fame revolution is we got to recognize things have changed. Life has changed. We need to work differently in a smarter way how do you um like even with companies how do you get them to realize that and have you been able to get them to realize that they need to invest differently is there a sense of realization that times have changed we need to do things differently very much so i think so um i was actually sitting in a conversation like that earlier today um it's getting harder and harder to get money for marketing because the, the marketing landscape is changing. And I myself as like a, a marketing leader in a company that sits with that problem, knows it firsthand. And um, like I, I started with that brand first, second, uh, content second approach, I've always been preaching this. I'm, there's no quick wins in marketing. You can't just throw money at ads and assume people will buy. Uh, people buy things they are interested in, but you first have to build that interest. And I think there's, there's definitely a, an uptake in the concept of the demand generation or like the awareness around demand generation, which is, I think, over the, the recent years become a big topic of conversation. Where if you come from a branding background, that is just like, guys, this is what we eat for breakfast. Like, this is how you build a brand. You generate demand for, for something. You build a community around an idea, around a product, around a company. Um, but it's definitely in moving in the right direction, I think. Uh, we see quite a bit of big companies opening chief brand positions, which is, uh, I think, so marketing is almost taking a step back. It's getting a little bit more primitive in that sense. So less focus on growth at all costs, where there's more focus on let's build something sustainable. Um, so for smaller companies and bigger companies, uh, but it still remains a channel because everyone's like, cool, if I give you $1, I want three back. And the problem with content is it doesn't necessarily work that way, not in the short run at least. I don't write an article and then magically it goes viral every time and my $1 turns into to $5. But if you look at it over like a three to five to 10 year period, that's what you actually need to do it. So what I often do is with the people I work at is take your marketing budget, it's an investment. So put it aside, commit to a number. And then tell your marketing department, this is what you can use, especially when you're like a startup. Um, put a number aside, but then almost forget about it. I don't forget it. You obviously want to see the returns, but don't ask what did happen? What happened for this money every month? Look back at the, after the year and look at like how your business grew. And then you ask the question, would my business have grown the same with that marketing or without that marketing? And you, at the same time, you buy data and then you can start making more clear decisions. 
but I, I definitely try to guide founders and CEOs to marketing as a long-term investment. Don't expect uh, quick wins. I'm not committing to quick wins. Uh, if you want to build a sustainable brand, you're going to need content. Content is going to cost money. Good people will cost money, and it's the long game. It is the long game. I think you're absolutely uh, right about that. Uh, when you look at brands, then with this whole component, there's a new com- concept that I've come across, and I kind of like it. I wanted to get your viewpoint on is is community branding. So, like companies no longer just brand themselves with the founder or the CEO, but they have a bouquet of people that become kind of thought leaders around it. And when I've talked about that to some CEOs, they're kind of like, no, I don't want to do that. I, they're going to leave me. Right. And so I'm investing all this stuff in people that might leave. And I don't know what you think about, about that component. It's an interesting dynamic, right? Um, I've got employee day, as the owner of the company or the, the leadership, I want everyone to talk about my company. Um, we just started this conversation by everyone should brand themselves. We live in a time where becoming famous as an individual is quite important. Um, now, I think it, it's a bit of a social dilemma in that sense. And I, I can only take myself as an example here. If I had to start working for a company and they're like, you please need to change your LinkedIn, you please need to change what you're talking about. No. Um, my brand was here before you. It's going to be wow. long after you. My opportunities are going to be uh, far reaching out of this. I'm not going to. No. And number two, my audience don't actually care about your company. They care about what I posted in the first place. So it's a conversation I'm very happy to get into. Um, on the one side, then on the other side, on the, the concept of community branding, I think it is very important that there are certain individuals in the company who lead that charge. Um, it's usually your top level management who sits with the best insight, right? They are the ones best equipped um, to add value through their own personal profiles. So if there are people who has not actually invested quite a bit in their personal brand, it's definitely worth uh, asking them or using their channels as distribution. Um, and you can do that in different ways. So what I always do is I, I'll have like a ghostwriter. If the CEO is too busy or the you know, the chief revenue officer is too busy, get a ghostwriter, get in there, get obviously knowledge transfer, but use those as distribution channels because if we just look at LinkedIn alone in like the B2B, B2B uh, space, personal profiles get a lot more reach than business profiles because naturally LinkedIn wants money if you're a business and you post content. like. You need to pay us to distribute this. So if you've got a a collection of like two, three or four uh, or even more uh, individuals on the team that can actually distribute that content, that is the quickest way to win. So I always preach, try to do this, uh, but mostly the founders, you are your business. Build your brand around your business. Um, And then through that, you also build the founder brand. So naturally, if your business gets big, you get that association with it as well. You can easily start another business, but build the brand next to your business brand. So what do you think about companies then investing in each employee, getting their own branding, and then taking their brand and tie it to the uh, company brand and kind of strategically decide how to utilize it. So maybe you say to your employee, hey, since you're working for Google now, we want you to kind of be a Google ambassador on LinkedIn, but on Instagram and Facebook, you can be your personal brand. Do you think that's going to be the discussion of the future? I think there's already some of it happening. Okay. I've seen I've seen companies like kind of like force their, at least their sales agents. Um, you have to fly the banner at least. Um, but it's, once again, it's a social dilemma. It's a, it's a very personal thing. To ask someone to use their own personal profile for the company's benefit, it's, you, you can't really lock that into a contract, right? It's like, uh, unless then you basically an influencer. Uh, so, but, uh, that's interesting. So what, so what could happen then, just if you're looking to the future from your discussion, is an employee could then come in and get extra money to become an influencer for the company. So say if you are an accountant, but you've got this great brand profile, you can then, the company can say, hey, we want to bring you on as an influencer plus being an accountant. Now, that's a different story, right? Because then you actually leverage that brand to 
Elevate brand or the, the, the company brand, right? Uh, so it's almost like influencers as employees. With, with that, I completely stand by. Um, that is because then they're not feeling used. They're not feeling used. Yeah, um, I get it. So if the company gets an individual who's already speaking to the same audience and more or less adding the same value that they want to add, that's a very powerful thing. And then you can benefit out of that employee's personal brand. But you can't expect that employee to give up his personal brand, his own personal brand, to only like promote the company. And if you if you really if you really think about why do you follow people, um, if you follow someone, or well, let's just use me as an example quickly. For if someone follows me for marketing advice, and I send a newsletter and they expect something on branding, and all of a sudden tomorrow, I'm talking about. Uh, drone technology for agriculture. <laughs> Something's not going to add up, right? Like I will, I will get a lot of unsubscribes, maybe not in the first one, but second email goes up. Okay, cool. Uh, the reason I followed you in the first place is now gone. Um, I liked your brand. I liked your content. And now this has been replaced by a company. Um, it will just fail in all, all directions. That is, my gosh, you just gave me, wow. And I think that's been my challenge because when I worked as a PR person and I'm almost like a fractional CMO sometimes taking on these companies, uh, the challenge has been with my business is that I leave my brand to be someone else's brand. And what you're actually saying is that no company can really ask you to do that anymore. And I think that's, I think that's a truth that's really new today. You can't ask people to utilize their LinkedIn, use their personal brand, because it takes away too much when everyone has to become famous. 100%. There are ways to to work around this, for instance. Not not everyone actively builds their brand on LinkedIn, right? They they kind of just use it for business or uh, then when you, uh, when you find a job, you happen to like, oh, maybe I should go on LinkedIn. Um, what I have seen work is if, if the marketing department or the content department uh, creates high value content and spotlight those individuals. Um, so if you have a, a decent video production capabilities in ours and you, whether you ask the person like, why do you work for this company? What do you like about your job? Or you feature them as, uh, hey, this week we're going to look at this employee or their story. They've been with the company three years. Or on the flip side, you ask them a question based on industry. So, hey, as a sales agent, uh, what do you see as this problem in the market and what is your advice to companies? Two sentences. And you've got a very decent piece of content where that person becomes the the front and center piece in the spotlight. They are much more willing to share that. But that's a completely different strategy than asking someone to to blend their brand with the company's one. Then they just become a distribution channel of the company because they're still a representative. Um, so what's the difference between that and then asking them to be a spokesperson? Or is there a difference or is there no difference? Uh, well, I think technically spoken, you're a, you're a spokesperson, right? You're just it's just a video that we created for you and you're going to post that, but right. you're not forcing them to post it. Uh, right. They do that out of their, their own free will. Where if you ask someone to be a spokesperson, that is, that's a lot more on you become the face of our brand. Uh, that is a different story. Uh, I think there's crossover now when you ask, hey, can you also use your LinkedIn to, to do this? Uh, that's a, it's a different conversation. Um, but I guess it's not much different than brand ambassadors, right? On on Instagram, for instance, oh, you just wear this shirt every time you make a video. <laughs> You're just an influencer. But it's so interesting because I think there's a delineation here that really needs to be teased out even more is that you can't, and I just know when I've been in a communications department, corporations, you're like, you're almost like forcing or you're trying to get people to be brand ambassadors and you're trying to get them to talk about the product, but it's always falling flat. You maybe have like out of a room of 10, one person might do it a little bit like your thing, two, three weeks, and then it falls off. But if there's a financial incentive to be the in, in influencer, like actually taking on that I'm an influencer and I'm the CPA of the company, then there, then it becomes more professionalized. And I think maybe that's been the challenge right now is not, the branding hasn't been recognized as we haven't recognized our employees or products as well as the person servicing us. But if we recognize those two, we might actually give, we might actually have to start thinking about 
using part of our marketing budget as an influence to the influencers within the company. The organization. I agree. I, I, post, I posted a poll on LinkedIn the other day. I was standing in the shower and I got this thought, why don't I just pay employees to post um, $5, $10 for like original written content? Nothing oh, fancy. Yeah. No, no one has to like design. And I asked uh, just, would you as a marketing leader do this? It, it sparked quite an interesting conversation. Um, naturally, us marketing people fall to like, oh, please don't let someone create their own content. But at the end of the day, it's still authentic. It still gets out there. And if there's some measure of control, like you can't just post anything, it has to at least like run past someone that checks it off as like, okay, that will actually pay you for that post. Even if it's not like high quality produced content, um, I think that marketing budget will go much further than boosting ads. And it will probably, and this is just my hypothesis here because I've not tested this, in the longer term have a bigger influence on returns than just an ad that says, hey, here's my product buy. Ah, that's fascinating. I um I didn't think about that. That's a really, really interesting thought. Where do you where do you think AI plays into all of this? Oh, I think it's polluting the internet uh, terribly. Um, I think AI makes terrible content, to be honest. Uh, and this just comes from someone that, that obviously all day, every day, deal with good writers um, who produce content. I can, I can spot AI written from a mile away. Like, and, and I just, my brain just shuts up. I'm not going to read this because it's AI. Like, this is no original thought. I think AI is polluting LinkedIn at the moment with comments, for instance. It is... I think, well, I'm preaching at the moment that if you use AI, it's the quickest way to break down your own brand. Uh, I think what AI is handy for is, is kind of uh, structuring, automation, um, even idea generation. But the moment you use AI to create content, and this is now written content, so the language models, I think it just breaks down anything that is good and unique about human creativity. Um, I think there's a difference on the, the design side. That's, that's quite cool what you can do with like the, the, the image generators and the videos. And I think that can complement good content. But AI is definitely not at a point where it creates good content, not from my perspective, at least. No, I agree with you. I like Grammarly, which is an editing tool just to edit to make sure you do your punctuations. But I have I totally agree with you that the um, AI does not really enhance the um they can maybe course correct you if it's something wrong not even that because i would i wouldn't trust it <laughs> so i completely agree I, I also use grammarly like something that as a tool that helps me get work out and higher quality faster by all means but the, the moment you try to substitute what you're writing i think number one you're kidding your your creativity and number two it's just i've just not seen ai to date and i'm quite sure this will change somewhere in the future but that that outrights a human a good writer at least yeah no that's uh, really interesting so where do you where do you think things are going to go next from your perspective to? yeah like you're you're in europe and i'm here in the u.s so what are you what are you seeing happening in europe that's really exciting within the space like i say it's uh Big push on demand chain, people buying from people. Um, I think the GDPR is, is changing a lot of things. You can't retarget people like you, you could a year ago. I can't just follow you around with ads when you were on my website. Um, there's also a big push. We see that people don't want to click a book a demo button anymore. Um, because I know what happens when I do. I get spammed by countless like sales emails and there's a sales agent climbing down my throat within four seconds trying to sell me the thing I was just on a website reading about. So there's a very big push to buy from people, be human, like be authentic, be human, founder led brands, build a personal brand, convince me that you actually have the insight that solves my problem. And I'll be interested to look at the company and the product that you sell. And, um, if you also look at the content that is put out there and the, the companies that are getting ahead, this is definitely the case. And this is the, the game is changing. And I think we're just scratching the surface at the moment. So uh, getting back to the topic of this, uh, where we started, build personal brands. This, uh, I think it's going to be invaluable. And also where the world is heading with regards to fractional and remote work, um, people with stronger personal brands will uh, 
uh, will be the ones that uh, reap the benefits. Um, you don't want to be stuck with a, a terrible profile with no followers, followers or community or voice at the end of the day um, in two, three years time. Wow. Yeah, it's all about the personal brand, isn't it? And how do people meet people uh, in this world where we the barrier is social media? Like it's a barrier, but it's not like I met you because I saw your post. But how like when someone's starting from scratch, how do those people meet people? Or is it just you have to build yourself up to, you then, have to build yourself up? You have to build yourself up. So there's a ramp up. It's a ramp up. And that's, that's going back to that. It will. It's not going to be Oh, you might get lucky and go viral and your first video. I've just never seen that happen. Um, but there's ways and there's means, but at the other of the end of the day, it's really putting in the ground, um, figuring out what you want to do, uh, having some sort of plan, and then pedal to the middle. That's fantastic. Get the work done. Well, I want to thank you for this uh, in fantastic interview. I would love for you just to end. Like, what what do you want uh, your tombstone to say or your legacy? Uh, like in Norway, we have this beautiful thing where when you're passing away, the priest tells your whole life story. And it's so beautiful because he interviews everyone. And so I remember I would listen to when my aunt passed away and my my uh, grandmother. And I was like, I didn't know that about them. Right. And they tell this whole story. And, and it's a shame because a lot of things we don't get to be known for. But what would you like to be known for? I guess for me, it really comes, I want to say, leave the world a better place, but that's the, that's the cliche. It's like, for me, it's, it's really that uh, everyone could say that I added value at every interaction, whether that is on a, a personal or friendship level or family or uh, someone that followed me or ever opened a newsletter or listened to a podcast that at least I added some value into someone's life some way, stop someone scrolling on the toilet in this fast fast moving world that we live in um, and I'll be okay with that. So yeah, leave the world a better place, but through every interaction at value. That's fantastic. Well, thank you, Stefan. Thank you for this interview. It was very, thank very, thank you for having me. Yes. And where can, and then we'll put in the show notes where we can find you, but definitely LinkedIn is probably the best place to find you. Are you on Twitter at all now? Or you've kind of left that? No, one I'm um, LinkedIn one man uh, show pony is uh yeah, LinkedIn is everything. There is a, a link to my website over there. I'm also doing a, a newsletter where I'm putting a little bit more kind of in-depth content, but exactly the same topics. Uh, so just where I, I take a little bit, I slow down and I, I write a little bit more in-depth, more thinking that goes into it. Um, so there's the newsletter and there's LinkedIn. Great. Well, we'll put that in the show notes. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keep bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry. Keep shining and see you next time.